Hello. Hi friends. My name is Nilesh. This video is about the continuation of Global Talent Visa for Australia. And this is the second part of the series where we are going to talk about how to apply for the Australian PR. Let's get started. In the first part of this series, we talked about the expression of interest or the first step in your application to the Australian Global Talent Visa or GTI or Global Talent Independent Visa, which is the uh, permanent residency pathway for highly talented people. In this video, we are going to see what you need to do once your application for the expression of interest is approved and you are invited to apply for the permanent residence for Australia. So in the previous video, we had looked at the two step process where first step is the expression of interest and upon approval, we go through the actual PR application. This video, we are going to focus on different steps related to this and how we go about submitting our permanent residency application for Australia and what are the different documents required and some of the tips based on my experience of going through this process. Let's start by looking at what is the prerequisite. The first and foremost, or rather the only prerequisite for this is to have that approval email from the immigration authorities or uh, department of the home affairs or external affairs. This consists of three things. When we get this email, it gives us a reference identifier using which we can apply for the permanent residence. It also gives us a code and the sector for which we can apply based on our expression of interest. So assuming you went through the process of applying the expression of interest based on what I explained in the previous video and you had a successful expression of interest and you received that email where the authorities requested you to apply for the PR. These are the list of documents which are required for submitting the visa application. Most of the documents are similar to what we have already submitted during the expression of interest, which includes form 1000, then the statement of the nominators, national reputation, uh, is the nominator still prominent? How can we be the asset to Australian community, ability to establish by means of gaining employment in Australia, international recognition and various other things. Apart from those documents which were submitted at the time of EOI, there are things like when it comes to identity, we need to submit the birth certificate, we need to submit the marriage certificate. If there was a change in the name, we need to provide that change in name certificate. And two most important things are the health examination and the character clearance certificate or the police certificate, PCC. So we will look at many of these important documents and uh, what are some of the things we need to keep in mind when we submit those documents. So these are the list of documents which I submitted and they're mostly similar to the EOI documents. The additional documents here when it comes to the nominator is the nominator's prominence, which in my case was the uh, approval letter of the GTI itself because my nominator was also a GTI recipient. So his approval of the GTI grant along with the nominator's passport. So we need to submit some identity of the nominator. It could be like the passport or there is a national ID and then the rest of the documents are similar like the employment status, earnings, qualification, supporting documents. I submitted the same set of documents. The additional documents which were submitted or required as part of the actual PR process includes medical test. We also have to submit the character certificate or the police clearance certificate PCC. This is required for each country that we have lived in the last 10 years for more than one year. So if you lived in different countries and your duration of stay in those multiple countries exceeds 12 months during the last 10 years, we need the uh, character certificate or the police clearance certificate from each of those countries. I also submitted the travel history for each of the applicant during the last 10 years. For the kids, I submitted the immunization records uh, these are all the vaccines that have been administered to the kids 
and we also need the functional English proof or English proficiency. This I submitted medium of instruction from the Education Institute for myself and my spouse. Now I recommended this particular website in my last video, which is the Facebook page or Facebook group for the Global Talent Visa 858. And as I said in that video, there are a lot of helpful tips which we get from the participants of this group. I got a lot of information for the documents which were being requested by the case officers for other applicants and I proactively submitted those documents before I was asked to submit them. When we apply for the visa, we have to create an account on the immigration website or IMI website and uh, these are some of the FAQs which are required to those documents which we have to submit. Let's go through them one by one and see what are the things which are required. Uh, do we need to submit all the documents at once? Now, luckily, when we apply for a PR, we get this portal and we can see the screenshot here using which we can submit different documents at different point in time. We do not need to submit all the documents in one go. It could take some time for us to procure some of these documents and uh, it's okay to submit the PR application and then we can iteratively add those documents once they are available. We also get a list of documents associated with each participant. So every participant that we add to our application has 60 documents limit and everybody can upload or individual participant can upload up to 60 documents. What if we don't have enough uh, space in our documents? Like if you are really well qualified and you need to submit more than 60 documents, then you can attach these under other participants details. That's a possibility. And is there any expiry for the expression of interest approval? Once it is approved, do we have any time limit within which we need to apply for the permanent residency? So the answer is no. But I recommend that you submit your PR application as soon as possible because the rules and regulations, they keep changing or they keep evolving. And as we saw in the earlier video, the threshold which is required for the Global Talent Independent or GTI visa, it has been reviewed every year and the current threshold is 175K Australian dollars. It could happen that if you wait for a longer period of time, this threshold keeps on increasing every year and that uh, might be a huge amount to meet. Along with that, the number of applicants which are approved, that also varies from year on year. So it's easier or it's beneficial for us to apply for this visa if we are serious about getting Australian PR as soon as we are ready for it. Moving on to the nominator, we talked about who can be a nominator. So I won't repeat those things. I've put this here for reference purpose in case you are coming directly to this video. I suggest that you go back to my previous video on global talent visa and expression of interest and see what is required for the nominator. The specific questions regarding 858 is can you submit your global talent visa without a nominator? And the answer is no. It is possible to submit the expression of interest without nominator, but not the visa form. The next question regarding nominator is can the nominator be changed after submitting the visa? The answer is no. If you want to change the nominator, it has to be done before you submit the application and before you make the payment. If your nominator is ineligible or does not have a national reputation, it is possible that your visa application might be rejected. And if it does not have uh, like a reputation, uh, in the email as well, it's uh, stated that once you get the UI approval, it is clearly mentioned that the reputation of your nominator or the status has not been verified or considered at the time of UI process. So it's important that you choose a nominator who is from the same field as uh, the field you are applying for and he has a natural uh, national reputation. 
without which your application might be delayed or it can be rejected as well. In the recent cases, we have seen that many of the people have been asked to provide more documentation to, pro, uh, to prove the prominence of the nominator. If the nominator is not very prominent person, it is possible that uh, you might be asked to provide additional documents to prove that he really has uh, standing in the Australian community or in the global community. The next question is what can I do if I don't have a nominator and as I explained in the previous part, you can uh, try to approach these authorities or organizations like the Australian Computer Society or ACS to see if they can nominate you based on your credentials and your qualifications. Does the nominator need to reside in Australia? A uh, simple answer is no. Uh, he can be residing outside of Australia, but he needs to have a national reputation or a good reputation uh, globally to be recognized as your nominator. So that's like a prerequisite in this case. Now a good thing or a good documentation to understand all these requirements is on the IMI website itself, imi.homeaffairs.gov.au and regarding the visas, there is this Global Talent Visa 858 how-to page which talks about the different stages and what are the documents which are required, what do you need to actually do and what are some of the uh, frequently asked questions or how can you gather those things which are required for your application. So this is that page where they talk about what you need before you apply. So even before you start thinking about submitting your expression of interest, you can go here and you can see how to get help with your application, what you need to gather the documents in terms of uh, identity documents, records of achievements. So you can uh, expand all these sections and see what documents can be submitted here. In terms of uh, records of achievement, again, there is a huge list in my previous video. Again, I mentioned some of this, but you can easily go through all these documents and or this one particular link and find out all the information that is required. And this is pertaining to the nominator. This is pertaining to the character documents. This is pertaining to establishing yourself in Australia. Uh, the functional English document. So all that that is required for getting this uh, documentation ready for this uh, PR application is explained in this step by step process. And highly, I highly recommend that uh, you go and have a look at that uh, as and when you start preparing those documents. The next set of questions are related to the medical test. Uh, mostly people ask if the medical test can be done before submitting the PR application. The answer is no, because you get a set of reference number based on how many applicants are applying. And these reference number, they also mention uh, like what kind of examinations needs to be done. There is a PDF which is sent along with all the details and this is generated automatically only when you make the payment for your visa fees, depending on whether you are applying alone or you are applying with additional participants. And based on that, you would be told what tests have to be done. How long are these medical tests valid? Usually most of the medical tests and even other documents that we are referring to, they are valid for 12 months. What if I have a medical condition? Now there are certain uh, uh, diseases or there are certain medical conditions which are checked during these medical tests and if you are found to have those medical conditions your application might be rejected. If the tests are not conclusive you might be asked to perform additional tests as well. Uh, one particular thing which is clearly checked during these medical tests is tuberculosis. So if you have symptoms of tuberculosis uh, that could be a sign that you might be asked to perform additional tests with regards to tuberculosis or certain uh, medical conditions which are like putting additional load on the uh, medical infrastructure of the Australia. Once you get the Australian PR, you are eligible for this Medicare facility and anything that's put extra load on the 
uh, these uh, facilities which are provided are usually checked during this process of medical test. Medical tests are applicable for primary applicants or for all. Now this depends on the age of the applicants and as I said earlier, your reference letter which is generated once you make the visa fees payment will tell you exactly based on your age and from where you are applying and various other factor what tests have to be conducted for each individual. There are some cases where people have been asked to specifically provide proof of certain vaccinations and this question again I see this coming up quite frequently in the uh, Facebook group and other forums. Uh, it's about does the person or the individual who is applying for the visa does he need to have or does he need to take specific vaccines. So it depends on your country of birth and where you are residing based on that the authorities might ask you for a certain vaccination proof or they might even ask you to take specific vaccine. Example of this is polio. I've seen some people who have been asked to provide a proof of polio vaccine being administered to them. Again this and the other details related to the medical test can be found on the link which is shown here in the screen and you will also find this link in the description of this video and this particular link talks about all the health related uh, tests which have to be done for all the Australian visas. You can drill down and look at the specific visa which is the global tenant visa in our case. The next set of questions that we are going to look or FAQs we are going to look are related to the character or police clearance certificate which is also called as PCC. Can I get a PCC before submitting the PR application? This depends purely on your country where you are residing and from where you are supposed to submit the uh, PCC. Some countries they require a letter from the uh, DOA or Department of Home Affairs and this is again generated when you make the payment or at the appropriate time in your uh, application process. Sometimes this is not required like when I was residing in Singapore before moving to Australia and when I needed this PCC, uh, when I submitted the proof that I have been asked to submit the uh, PCC via the expression of interest approval email that was good enough for the Singapore authorities to issue me a PCC. I think it is same for the Indian authorities as well. You can use that same email as a supporting document to request for a PCC but in some other countries they do require a specific letter and this is provided by DO, uh, DOHA when the time is appropriate for that. So you might have to wait for the DOHA to generate that letter for you. How long is the PCC valid? This again is usually valid for 12 months. Do I need PCC from every country where I visited in last 10 years? This is where I see a lot of confusion in the forums where people say uh, you should try to get the PCC from uh, various countries and the answer to this is you don't require from every country that you visit but only the countries where your stay over the last 10 years has been more than a year. So if you visit your home country every few years and you stay for three or four weeks during those visits it is possible that your total stay during last 10 years would have exceeded one year or you have lived in multiple countries for more than one year then you will have to go and get PCC from each of those countries. How much time do I have to submit the PCC and even the medical test? You are usually given four weeks time and exceptions can be sought in case you are not able to get those documents in four weeks time. Uh, usually I have seen that Australian authorities are uh, willing to give you extension if you can explain them using the proof that you have requested the concerned authorities for the required documents and it takes longer than four weeks. Uh, it's not like if you submit or if you cannot submit in four weeks your application would be rejected. As long as you can give a valid reason for a delay it is fine to uh, submit these documents at a later point in time. And the last question regarding the PCC or validity of the PCC is 
do you have to take up the PCC or redo the PCC after 12 months? So assuming your application takes longer than 12 months from the time you make the payment, uh, then in that case, once the validity of your document expires, you need to uh, resubmit the next document. So here I've put a link at the bottom to the e-services of the Singapore police where I obtained the uh, PCC from and uh, these rules and regulations again they keep on changing based on different uh, times so recently i saw that since the time i applied there have been slight changes to the overall process so that is why i put the link depending on at what point of time you're looking at this particular page the requirements might be different and these requirements again would vary based on different countries so i suggest you have a look at your own countries or where you are residing the requirements to get the PCC. The next one is regarding English proficiency and I had mentioned about this one in the previous video as well. Do I need to have uh, to answer the IELTS or PTE or any other English proficiency test? With regards to the global talent visa specifically, there is no need to have this English proficiency test. All you need is a functional English and you need to provide a proof that you have obtained functional English or you have uh, functional English uh, to be demonstrated. In my case, I use the medium of instruction certificate from my education institute and also for my wife. Uh, and again, I've put a link at the bottom which says uh, what is the requirement for English language and depending on the type of the visa you are applying for Australia, uh, the requirements for English language are different. The cutoff also in case you have to take IELTS or PT are also different for different types of visas. So assuming that you did not take up your studies in English medium or your instruction uh, or your institute does not provide a medium of instruction uh, certificate. In that case, you would be required to take up one of these English proficiency tests and you can refer to this link to find out which test is applicable. If I have it open, then we can quickly have a look. So you can see in this particular page, uh, when it comes to English language, this talks about different visas and different types of English tests which are required. Since we are talking about functional English, which is the requirement for global talent visa, you can see based on the institute where you studied whether you studied in australia or outside of australia and based on uh, what level of studies you did like the primary school or secondary school you need to have at least three years of secondary study uh, if a secondary school is in or outside australia you need to have at least five years of study and so on and so forth it also talks about what should be the score if you have to take up a test like IELTS or the uh, PT or Cambridge English in these different tests what should be the score to qualify for this the next question is about uh, does all applicants need functional English in this case for the global talent visa it's only the applicants who are above 18 years of age that need to demonstrate the functional English and are there any alternatives if you don't have English language proficiency? As far as I know, you can make an additional payment for the dependents. I did not see an option for the primary applicant to make additional payment uh, to bypass the English language requirement. If you don't know English, I think it would be difficult. If you don't have even the functional English, I mean, it would be difficult for you to survive in Australia. So for that reason, I think uh, the primary applicant does not have that option. I was trying to find a reference to that, but unfortunately I couldn't. So my assumption is this option is applicable only for the dependents and you can pay some additional fees. If you want the dependents who are not English proficient uh, to get the visa. Can I reuse old test results? Now, uh, this applies where you already have these tests it could be IELTS, PTE or any of the other tests. 
and you want to reuse those results they can be used only if they are still valid and uh, i did not answer any of these tests so i don't know what is the validity of those tests i guess uh, based on again the forums and uh, other media where i've seen it uh, it could be two or three years so as long as they are still valid you can submit those results and here are some of the generic questions that i've seen over the last year or so from different applicants and coming through that uh, facebook page do you need to submit form 100 now form 100 is similar to form 1000 but it has a lot of other additional details like your family details your travel history and all other things do you need to submit this again this depends on uh, the case officer and I think it also depends on the country from where you are applying so in my case I was not required to submit this form it is optional this has been digitized by the application form that has been created when we submit the uh, PR application so the contents are uh, similar to the PDF or the physical form that is why I did not have to submit it but I've seen one or two cases where people said that they received a S56 or additional document request to submit this form. So this is purely on case by case basis and I did not submit this but you might be asked to submit it depending on some situations. Can you update the documents which are already submitted or any changes to your application? Certainly yes. It is highly recommended and it is also required by the uh, DOA or the authorities to keep your documents updated. You can use change in situation option to communicate any changes to the documents. Uh, I had to use this option for uh, one of the applicant whose passport had expired and I had to update the passport number uh, after the visa was approved and before I migrated to Australia. So. Uh, we have this uh, IMI portal where we can use it to upload all the documents related to our application and uh, we can communicate these changes using this change in situation. It could be things like change in address, change in contact number, you are adding new family members like uh, if someone is born in your family or any of those situations which are related to your current situation that you are living in. What happens if you miss to submit a document? Now, if the document is uh, sort of mandatory or required for the whole process, then you would get a request from the case officer asking you to submit that document. It could be a existing document which needs modifications. Uh, example could be you submitted something which is not in English and it needs to be translated. You forgot to translate that. Then uh, in those cases, you will get an additional request uh, to submit the right document or if the document is missing which is expected then also you will get these kind of additional requests from the case officer the gti once you get the pr the permanent resident is it applicable to a specific region now there are some visas in uh, australia which are very specific to a region and when you get uh, approved for that particular visa you have to spend certain number of years like couple of years in that region or in that state before you can apply for next visa or you can move to different state when it comes to global talent visa as this is I said it's a global talent and you are getting a visa which is applicable to whole of australia you do not have any restrictions you can work anywhere in australia and Apart from just you, the primary applicant, each applicant that you apply for this visa, they also get a permanent residency when it is approved and they can work separately in different places or like if you have kids who want to study in a different state, it is quite possible that your family members could be spread across Australia if you wish to. How much fees do I need to pay for the PR application? Now this varies from time to time as of today the 4th of August when I am recording this video the fees is around 4840 for primary applicant and there are additional fees for the dependents 
this again depends on the age and other factors what kind of dependent you are applying so let's go and see what are the fees uh, for this particular visa i had that page open yeah if we head over to the visa fees and charges uh, we can see for global talent visa here the primary applicant is 4840 uh, spouse or partner is 2425 and uh, kids or children are 1210 each this fees again they vary from time to time you will find the link to this fees and charges in the description of the video and you can find out what is the ongoing rate how much time does this take for the processing it again depends on various other factors in my case it took about 10 months from the time i applied the expression of interest till my visa was approved the usual time frame or the current time frame is published on this page called global visa processing times and uh, this is for all the different types of visas you can head over to this page and you can find out what is the current uh, time or expected time 50 percent of the applications in this screenshot have been processed within 10 months and 90 percent have been within 13 months but this again varies depending on different times of the year so i suggest you have a look at this particular page to get more understanding of what's the current time frame that you can expect if you have any problems with these time frames uh, and if your application your, let's say you submitted it and has not been processed within these time frames and you want to raise a complaint or you want to talk to someone there is this global service center where you can reach out to the authorities uh, monday to friday 9 to 5 pm and the number is on the screen here i've also put the link at the bottom where you can reach out for support here are some of the tips based on my experience and what i've heard from other people who have already gone through this visa and looking at the facebook group uh, my first recommendation is to keep all the documents and information consistent and updated and also group the related document I put a screenshot on the right here to say how these are organized in the EMI website. So once you lodge your application, you will have for each applicant these different sections related to the national identity, relationship, evidence uh, to become eligible in Australia or established in Australia, uh, evidence of your achievements and whatever documents you submit under these different categories you will get to know how many documents have been submitted. And uh, uh, I suggest that you group them logically. Now, since we have the limit of 60 documents, you can create like a Word document, Excel document or a PDF, which consolidates a set of related documents. Like in my case, I had this public talks like keynote speaking, the YouTube videos, those kind of things. I put them in one Word document and created a PDF document with all the links to those documents. Instead of creating or submitting one document at a time, I created a PDF with all the links with logical grouping of the documents. So that way you can create logical documents, group them together and reduce the number of documents that you upload on the EMI website. Choose the nominator wisely. This I can uh, stress so much time on this because you cannot change the nominator once you submit the application and if your nominator doesn't have a prominence in the industry that you are applying or the sector that you are applying your application might be rejected for that reason there are also cases where people get the documents signed by uh, nominator or these are encrypted documents and the authorities, once you upload them, have no means of decrypting them. So before you upload the documents, make sure you upload them in the unencrypted form. You can put whatever password or whatever way you have to decrypt the document and scan the decrypted document and upload them in decrypted form. Keep things simple and easy to understand. And one recommendation here is as you can see on the right, there are different subsections within the uh, each applicant. 
So try to name the documents consistently so that it is easier for the person who is reviewing your application to look at the name of the document and to identify what it relates to instead of just putting a document which says document one or download one, download two like that. Make sure that you have proper naming and you name those documents same way for all the applicants if you have multiple applicants in your uh, application. Try to avoid getting S56 because every time you get this request for additional document which is called as a S56 request, it causes a delay of about two to four months for every request. Hopefully, if there are multiple documents to be submitted, your case officer identifies all of them together and sends you one S56 for all the documents which are required. But in case uh, this doesn't happen, then you can expect a delay of about two to four months for every additional request. And that can lead to uh, multiple delays if it happens. So to avoid any delay in the processing, make sure that your documents which are required are properly submitted in a timely manner and uh, they are as per the expectations of the authorities. Be proactive in submitting these documents. This is where that Facebook group comes very handy. You get updates about what is the timeline which is going on in terms of expression of interest as well as visa processing. And people talk about what case officers are asking other participants or other applicants to submit. I got things like uh, the vaccination for kids, the uh, travel history, those kind of things which I had not initially submitted based on the request that was made to other participants and I submitted those documents proactively myself. So. I highly recommend that you have a look at what's going on on that Facebook group as people keep posting about what they have been asked to submit. And if you have not submitted those documents, it's a good opportunity for you to proactively submit them. Do not panic and always keep Department of Home Affairs updated with any changes. Even if you submitted some document by mistake, you can use uh, different means to communicate with them and update them about any mistakes that have happened in your application. And last but not the least, uh, it's a very simple thing, but we sometimes miss this. Do check your spam or junk mails because sometimes some of these mails, they might end up in your spam folder or junk mail folder. Just to avoid any delays, make sure that once in a while, if you are expecting some response, uh, do have a look at your spam folder. So that was pretty much what I had done in terms of submitting my PR application. That brings us to the end of this video. In the part one, we covered about expression of interest. Part two is about the PR application. What are the different things which are required? And we covered some frequently asked questions as well as part of that. If you have come this far, I hope that you are going to uh, be one of the applicant for the Australian PR. Good luck to you. It's time for you to call up your Aussie mates and if some of them are prominent in the areas, uh, have some beer and have that discussion about how they can be your nominator and hopefully you will join them in future. So with that, we come to the end of this video. I hope you will also come back and look at part three which will be the next video in this series. Hopefully you found this content useful. If you like the contents of the video, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and share it with your friends. Thanks for watching this. Until next time, code with passion and strive for excellence.